so, so obviously I'm, I'm not trying to represent a world that we might see. In fact, I'm trying to represent a world that we actually we don't see and we have enormous problems in doing so. Um, and it's a world that we usually try and represent through a different technique entirely. Uh, that's the bit, I suppose, from Penn. Um, we usually try and do it through narrative. So we're all aware that as, as we start learning about archaeology, there are classic books that tell us about the history of the discipline and so forth. And there are problems with those, obviously, in that they're usually produced by a series of senior scholars who have a particular uh, way of reading the material. S some of them are great. Some of them are pioneering. The work by Glyn Daniel is like that. But there is getting a stage now where we are getting to the, to the point where we simply cannot do that anymore. If you think back to what is the age of the most recent book you've read on the history of archaeology? My guess is it's going to be 10, 12 years, something like that. Um, and part of the reason for that, that we're not particularly aware of, is just how much stuff we produce. And so you're going to hate me for these slides because they're all slightly too small. But this is basically just talking about the quantity of research pieces that we produce in a year. So it's taking data from Scopus. It's not everything. But in 2021, something like 7,420-odd pieces of research in archaeology were published. Scopus is biased towards English language, so it's missing out a lot of our you know, European, African, etc. And everything that's being produced in the developer-funded world is absent because Scopus doesn't pick that up. Um, how do we make sense of that? When we look at this literature as archaeologists, we don't just stick to this year's research. My students would love it if we did. Even, even then, actually, to be honest, they wouldn't be able to read it. Um, we look back. And you'll see in archaeological um, accounts that people are talking about stuff from the 60s or 70s or 80s or even the 19th century. I'm a Paleolithic archaeologist. We still cite Darwin, for example. Um, these days, you could cite stuff from about 106 or 107,000 pieces. And I did a brief calculation. Let's imagine you read seven pieces a day, seven days a week, all the weeks of the year. It would take you 56 years to read what we have read so far, by which time it will be eight times larger in size. We are growing at that sort of scale. So the question is, how do we begin to get a sense of what, of what we're up to? And one way we can do that is by thinking about different ways to try and represent our thinking. And we can think about that visually, I suppose. And there are ways in which the visual world offers us opportunities because we're interested in proximity. You know, who is writing stuff about similar sorts of things? We're interested in scale, about the quantity of material. We're interested in how those things change through time. And they're a little bit like an atlas in that sense. An atlas provides us with an opportunity to see the relationships between things. In an ideal world, it represents a scale, although, of course, they are constructed scales, so they're not real in that particular sort of sense. But they also give us that opportunity to engage with them. And one of the things that we can see now is that there are lots of techniques by which we can begin to take some of the material, um, in particular, the basic information that exists about documents, so the metadata. The metadata in simple terms would be when it's made. Um, place of publication, you have the source title, authors, who their authors, where they're based. We can begin to look at links that sort of way. Um, the language, and we can look at the language in terms of the keywords, for example, the words that you might choose, the words that you think are going to best describe your research to somebody else, versus the language that you use in terms of the titles and your abstracts. They're different. We'll see that in a brief moment. Um, these days, for many stuff, we can also pull out the full text and we can extract the language from that. And what this material does is it gives us a sense of being able to create relationships between people and between documents and topics and themes, etc. And we can begin to visualize that. And that is the sort of hidden landscape that I want to talk to you a little bit about. And I see that as a little bit like aerial photography and landscape work to begin with, that sense of being able to see slightly bigger so that we can begin to focus in on something and put our effort into that reading in a more directed way. Just to give you a sense of the sorts of relationships you're creating. So documents one through five are published, let's say this year. And we can see that two, three, four are all making relationship to two earlier documents. What that's telling us is that for those documents, two, three, four, those earlier documents, A and B, are significant to their understanding of their particular topic. And depending on how many they are and how close they are, we can begin to pull things together in terms of people talking about the same stuff. And that's roughly the way it goes. There are complexities about how people cite, and there is a 50-year literature of that, but I won't go into that. 
So I want to show you some maps, and these are the bits you'll hate me for, but you can look at them all online, actually. They've both been published in, or they have all been published in Internet Archaeology, and you can, you can explore them. And there are some differences between earlier and later versions. But I want to talk about three sorts of things, one of which is how we can look at change through time, and how that begins to tell us about how the discipline changes. The second one is I want to look at how our language for talking about archaeology changes, and what that tells us about um, how we conceive and how we communicate. And the third thing is I want to compare archaeology to another discipline. I come from a, a school of historians, archaeologists, classicists, etc. My colleagues who are historians, and I've been doing a little bit of work with them, and we'll see that history and archaeology are very different. This is where you should go if you want to see these ones. So there's a piece I published in 2016 in International Archaeology. They're open access. And the type of maps you will see there are, when I originally did it, they're screenshots stitched together. They are gigantic 120 megabyte files. And if you want to find something, pick up a magnifying glass and wade your way through. But to be honest, you can ignore that one, really, because more recently, in fact, last Monday, you can now look at this. And you can look at all the maps interactively, and I've done the earlier period as well. Um, and it's to give you a sense of the sorts of things that you can, you can actually do with this um, technology. So here is us as archaeology, and this is all the stuff we cite. So we're looking at our sources. And slap bang in the middle here is the Journal of Archaeological Science. Um, we're sitting in TAG, obviously, and we like to think that it's the theoretical ideas that drive the shape of archaeology. Think again. Since the 1960s, it's the way in which archaeology has engaged with science. And the key thing about us, of course, is that there isn't something over there that we think, actually, that's not really archaeology. I can leave that be. Archaeologists are not like that. We go over there, we climb over the fence, and we borrow what they do. And so archaeology is constantly growing. So in this particular case, this is all that classic archaeological stuff. That's all the archaeological science over there. If we look at it more recently, so that first map, that's based on 26,000 documents. There's about four or five, no, maybe about 10 years worth of reading in that up. For the last seven years, we're on about 56,000 documents. Okay, nobody's read anything like that much. See how the stuff we consider to be basically archaeology is, is becoming the bit on the side of what we do. That's the way in which archaeology is growing. Look at our language. So these are terms that are extracted from titles and abstracts. And what they do is they tell us about different topics we're talking about. So theory and interpretation, for example, the classical world, aspects of social complexity. Everything across here is our engagement with science and techniques of finding out about the world using methods that have not necessarily been developed in archaeology, but well, actually usually not. The really interesting thing about this, when we look at how we describe our studies through our titles and abstracts, the key thing that comes out is that archaeology is a process that engages with data. We talk about samples, we talk about reliability, we're talking about um, different types of techniques for looking at things. Okay? When you use keywords, you don't put any of that in. That's interesting, isn't it, don't you think? And everything maps one on top of each other. And the reason is, if you go and look at those keywords, we talk about the period, we talk about the place, we put in the site name, we might put in the method. And because everything doubles up over that, we just get a sense of, well, we get a sense of a coherent discipline, but we don't get a sense of the ways in which we engage with our material. And that's really extraordinary, I think. Now, authors, of course, come from places, and so we can start to look at the places and how they create links. And this is one of those effects of science. It's now increasingly difficult to produce stuff on your own as an archaeologist. You have to work with somebody else. They bring those skills that we have appropriated. And that means that we have collaborative links, and those collaborative links are international links. So this is archaeology between 2014 and 2021. And whilst there are groups of us that have primary contacts within our local area, you'd expect that. Geography dictates that. There is nowhere across the world that does archaeology that is not tied into a global research context. It doesn't matter whether you're in South America, in North America, in Africa, in China, and so on. If we were to look at it through time, 
you'll see the impact and the rise of Chinese science. They're putting lots of money into it, obviously, and China is now a significant player in terms of international links and research. These two are. So these are my colleagues who are historians. So I've got my historian colleagues to choose a data set for me to make sure it's a reliable one. This is the links in history in 2000 to 2009, and they've chosen a really good representative sample. All of these are English language institutions. The map of archaeology looked pretty much like the previous map for that period. History is a much, much bigger discipline than archaeology. There are five times as many historians as there are archaeologists at the very least. We would not expect this to be the case. Move forward to the last 10 years or so, and we can see that whilst they are moving towards being a more collaborative discipline, actually it's still primarily an English language collaboration that exists. And the interesting thing is you can see all of these institutions that are laid around the outside are places where people are happily working on their own. Absolutely extraordinary. So what I want to get across to you, I suppose, is that there is a way in which we can take something that we had previously looked at through reading and through narrative, through sequence and through authority, in a sense, and we can begin to pull out sets of data that allow us to represent a, a different perspective of archaeology. And the great thing about it is that that authority that we used to get with senior figures who wrote it is, is partly upended, I suppose, because now anybody can access that data and anyone can begin to interact with that data and anyone can begin to classify it and categorize it and to engage with it. And it gives us a much fuller and different way of understanding it. Um, I, I come from where I'm having to teach students about what archaeology looks like. Um, every year, they desperately don't want to learn about theory in that sense. And it's partly that sense of having to read so much and try and build it up. This gives them a different sort of way of being able to understand some big ideas about how the discipline has grown. Thank you.